Funding for Frontline is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Have mercy! Tonight on Frontline, the prayer, pride, and power of the black church. The church is what we have had all the time, all the way back to slavery. It's what kept us going was the church. Young, successful blacks are returning to their church in record numbers, seeking the racial, political, and spiritual core of life in black America. The culture says you're inferior. The Christ says you are equal. The church says, Tonight, say keeping the faith. God bless you, my father's children. Arise and know that From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Tonight, a report on a powerful institution which has provided comfort and direction for millions of Americans, the black church. It has shaped our society and affected all our lives. It's been called the largest black business in America, with at least 20 million members and assets estimated to be at least $10 billion. Its potential power is enormous. And because the black middle class is attending in increasing numbers, the church today is growing. But as it grows, is it changing? Will its long-standing commitment to the poor and powerless continue? To find out whether the church is fulfilling that legacy, frontline correspondent Roger Wilkins went to Chicago with producer Sherry Jones and co-producer Christine Intagliata. Their program is called Keeping the Faith. Eleven o'clock Sunday morning. In the 1950s, this was called the most segregated hour in America. After all these years, the fact that America's churches aren't very much more integrated now than they were then says something profound about our national community and the way it has developed. Trinity United Church of Christ on the far south side of Chicago begins each Sunday with a welcoming ritual. I came here to look at a church whose congregation of 4,500 members is drawn mostly from the black middle class, that part of the black population that has grown substantially since the civil rights movement changed the nation. says in, in Deuteronomy, he warns the children of Israel, he says, you know, while you were in the wilderness, you, you trusted God, okay? Now you're getting ready to go into a land and live in houses you didn't build, eat fruit you didn't plant. Be careful, because you're going to get rich. In the black community, there's a song, you, people sure act funny when they get a little money. The higher up you go on a social economic scale, the more cut off from who you are and whose you are people become.
16 years ago, when Jeremiah Wright was called to its pulpit, Trinity was what he calls a white church in blackface. It had none of the pulsing human power of the black church tradition, and it had 87 members. In many of the churches that quote middle class churches, uh, they don't sing gospel music. That is undignified. That is not dignified enough. That's correct. Wasn't white enough, was it? All right, if you want to put it that way, it wasn't. It wasn't quote white. <laughs> This church teaches young black people about their heritage from whence they came. I think there should be a lot more of it. I don't think that there is enough. I think there are still too many black people who think white entirely too much. They just don't think black enough. I have a friend who every time you greet him, every time you ask him how you doing, answers, just trying to make it, man. Just trying to make it. When I say, what's happening, bro? What's to it? What it is? His answer is always the same. Just trying to make it, man. Just trying to make it. As I listen to his words and listen to our lives, I hear a strange similarity where so many of us are just trying to make it, man. Just trying to make it. I see a young couple, two beautiful black people, struggling to survive, struggling to keep their marriage alive, hardly enough money to pay bills and buy food, no money for frills and with little children, no time for frivolity. He is black and underpaid with a degree. He makes less than the boss's kid and the boss's kid don't have no degree, but he does have white skin. He is black and underpaid. She is tired and having second thoughts. And as I see them struggle to keep hope from dying, struggle to keep healthy self-esteem, struggle in an environment that seeks to strangle them. I see this young black couple just trying to make it. Much of the black middle class moves across the thinnest psychic ice, not rich and powerful enough to be truly free, too far from the old black culture to be totally comfortable. I was a, a poor person trying to make it. And I felt, you know, I guess I felt tricked in a lot of ways. You know, I've been, you know, they keep, everybody was telling me, oh, you, you know, if you go to school, you'll have it made. And I realized that that was not it, that my color and my racial uh, background or my racial roots would always be there. When you play by the rules, uh, you get an MBA from Harvard, uh, you've been groomed to be the chief executive officer only to realize you are not going to be in that position. There will come a point at some, at some time where you have to realize there's a higher force uh, beyond your employer, beyond your Mercedes, beyond your degree. There will come a time when you will be humble and you will need to return back to where your roots were. What Trinity is saying and what many middle class blacks are finding out that there, there's still the struggle there. They have not made it. They're still struggling. Then remember, Lord, those with special concerns around this altar this morning. You know their hearts, you know their homes, you know their hurts, you know their hopes. Touch and bless with every blessing you see we stand in need of. You said you supply our every need. We've got needs this morning, Lord, bless. And then when we finish having church, help us to be your church. After the benediction, help us to be your church. In our homes, help us to be your church. In our private lives, help us to be your church. In our dealings one with another, help us to be your church. Though our minds wonder, our souls love only you. Let the church say amen. Say amen again. God bless you, my father's children. Arise and know that he hears and that he answers every prayer.
In 1966, Martin Luther King called Chicago the most ghettoized city in America, the backbone of segregation. Today, it's a city with a black mayor. But in the last 20 years, America has done almost all the easy integrating there is to do. The most fortunate blacks have gone to college and to professional schools. They have become government officials and bank tellers, corporate executives and entrepreneurs. And with the money earned from their jobs in the cities, they have moved toward the suburbs. The inner city poor are stuck and alone, more isolated than ever, living in stark urban desolation. They have lost middle income people, vibrant areas of commerce, community organizations, and successful role models. And they have lost their big and successful churches. Because it is the one institution in the community beyond white control, the black church has always been the racial, political, and economic center of black life. But now many of the churches that minister to the black poor are tiny storefronts, like the purchased Church of God. Hi, how you doing today? How many in your family? Six. Any children under 18? No. Its ministry includes a regular food pantry for families who are hungry. Around the block, yeah. Yeah. The vision here of a better world might be engulfed in the immensity of the need, were it not for the diamond-bright faith of Elder John Burton. My heart goes out for these people, anyone that's hungry, because I've known hunger. So it's, it's just a thing that's in my heart. My mother was that way. She would give you the dress off of her back. <laughs> but uh, I love it. It's, it's my ministry. God, I guess God just intended for me to do this type thing because I feel blessed in doing it. Hi, how you doing? Nah. I am so sorry. We can only sorry be that, that's okay. Yeah, that's it. We're out. Oh, yeah? Uh -huh. Okay. We can only take 11 more. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See you next sorry. time. Yeah. Every week the story is the same. There is never enough for all who are needy. Actually, it was intended from the beginning that the church take care of this kind of need of the people. And it was written right into the laws of God from the beginning. Hallelujah! You know, it's a blessing to be saved yes, and Lord. sanctified yes, and have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. Yes, yes, because the Bible says in this flesh, yes. don't dwell nothing good. Yes. You know, you get in a state where you sleep. And somebody got to shake you and wake you yes, up. Yes. yes. Glory to God. And that's what the Spirit of the Lord does. Some blacks have likened experience in this country to a lifelong storm and the black church to a shelter from the storm. A rock, a refuge. Let me tell you about a man Known by many, accepted by few right, right. He'll heal your wounded spirit And give you joy and happiness you never knew If I keep my mind on the Father above He will keep me in perfect peace Hallelujah. Black church has always been about strength, about liberation, lifting up. At a weeknight service at Trinity, just a block away from Purchased, in a neighborhood that lies between the inner city and the suburbs, there are shared spiritual and emotional links to the past. The church is what we have had all the time, all the way back 
to slavery, we had the church. Even as Reverend puts it, when you had to sneak off into the backwoods to worship God, we had him all the time. It was the strength of the black people. It's what kept us going was the church. This is where we get our, our foundation from. It's, we are founded on that. That religion from our foreparents, the old slaves, brought us up to where we are today. We didn't come on our own merits. They prayed and prayed and prayed. My grandmother was, great-grandmother, was from the Mount of Glaster Islands. And she used to tell us how her mother used to, t come when she came into the United States, she used to turn the wash pot down so they could not hear the slaves sing and pray. And she used to say that's how they come up with that old hymn called Dr. Watts. They had no music and they didn't know nothing. They knew the words and they put it into a song. That's why people cannot play a piano with Dr. Watts. That is strictly an acapella it's not music. not supposed to have music in it. Life for blacks during slavery was truly a storm. Their hidden religion provided respite from their deadening lives. spring of political and social action in black America. It rose up in the late 50s and early 60s and provided the backbone for the civil rights movement. It provided the music too. Blacks who have become successful are coming back to churches like Trinity in large numbers, to churches that are clearly strengthening the souls of the people who seek them. Well, I want to spend a part of our lesson today talking about Liberia. First of all, Redonna just showed us that... The Liberia rooms of Trinity are crammed full of its members, all day, every day, engaged in political as well as religious education. Collecting food for those who are hungry, dealing with problems in the lives of its teenagers, the truth to yourself. all in an attempt to give strength during the trial of being black in America. Sing me that old song. A rehearsal for a special ceremony serves to remind that a major strand of the black experience in this country has been the loss in a sea of whiteness by many in each new generation of a sense of their own identity. Because one of the requirements for getting ahead has been for blacks to forget their people's past, to shed any memory of their lives before they were brought to this country as slaves. consciousness movement of the 60s addressed the issue of identity on many levels. Cultural history was restored. Black became beautiful. 
And there was a deep revolution in the spiritual lives of thousands of young black ministers like Jeremiah Wright, who began to examine the needs of their people. How about the fact that we have pledged to take what we've got as black people and put it back into the black community? That's what I want to ask you. Do you do that? Do you believe that? Right, Deacon Green said we believe it, but we don't do it. They also began to explore the universality both of God's love and of God's color. Wright's ministry at Trinity bears the hallmarks of that spiritual revolution. Long after the last street corner revolutionary folded up his dashiki and headed off to law school. Today, Trinity is one of the fastest growing and strongest black churches in America. A ministry suffused by black consciousness is especially sensitive to the developing identities of the children of the church. In this case, the young black men. Well, I would like to be a, a baker. I think I have, well, the qualities to become a baker, and I like to cook, uh -huh. and I like to eat, too. All right. <laughs> so. I watched TV and looked at lawyers through the past years, and I basically like, you know, the field of being a lawyer. It's like... It's really exciting. As a matter of fact, there's, there are a couple lawyers here in the church that maybe we could just hook you up with, and you could just do like a little internship with them. Go down, follow them around, go into the courtroom, see what it actually tastes, because sometimes we get a misconception about what law is about because we see the exciting part of it. Well, I like to be a doctor. You can't beat what you ain't seen. And so many of our young boys haven't seen nothing but the gangs and the pimps and the brothers on the corner. They've never sat and talked to lawyers. They've never sat and talked to, to a man, a black man with two, three degrees. Um, they've never had a chance. They never had an option in terms of thinking, I can do this, I can be this. Uh, they see a doctor when they're sick. They don't, they don't get to sit and talk to like me, go to med school. They don't talk to somebody who writes programs and analyzes systems and computers. A black guy, I, I can do this. I can never have their horizons lifted. That kind of practical reaching out will pull young brothers into the church. One, commitment to the black community. Three, commitment to the black family. Four, dedication. Every situation was, was, was like I was on stage, you know, like I was an actor on stage and I was looking for somebody to applaud or say, good, no good, where's the hook, you know. Many older members of the church you know, deal with the ravages said, of racism in their lives often through individual counseling yeah, sessions with Reverend Wright. You have to act a certain way, pretend with a mask and play a role rather than be Howard. Mm -hmm. Why can't you just be Howard? I'm finding that out now. I mean, Howard is cool. <laughs> God made Howard. But she used to think that Howard was not Yeah, cool. yeah. Um, there's a verse that has taken me through the past month or so. Isaiah 43, uh, 1 to 5. Mm -hmm. I don't memorize it by heart. What the Lord says is, When you pass through the fire, and the trouble and the deep waters, I will always be there. And, and I like that part. And I like the part where he says, I will give up Egypt for you. I will mm -hmm. give up Sudan for you. I will give up nations for you. You know, who, who you know gonna give up all of that for you? <laughs> For me, who you know gonna give up all of that? You know, people won't even give up a dime, you know. And and the best part is what it really means to be created in the image of God that you are okay as God created you. Um, that's a very difficult lesson. African Americans were the only persons in this melting pot who were systematically stripped of their history, their heritage, and who they were as persons. If I can somehow be white. A lot of black people have that feeling. Um, if I can somehow be accepted, um, and Africa's a bad thing, I'm not African. I'm not African. I'm part Indian. I'm, I'm part Chinese. I'm part anything. Oh, now they're doing a skit. Oh, come on, Lucinda. The inner city can tear teenagers apart, 
Some of the most self-destructive behavior of black teenagers is a direct result of self-esteem destroyed by racism. At regular youth fellowships, Trinity gives the youngsters themselves opportunities to explore their lives. This night, they improvise a first meeting between two black girls and two girls who are white. I don't know if you have met my, um, you know, the two new girls that moved into the school. Well, um, it's nice to meet you. Meet, meet you all. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. So, um, what's this? What is this? <laughs> so, um, Lord, get me out of here. <laughs> well, I guess it's time for us to go. Yeah. Our mom wants us home by a certain time. Uh, okay, well, okay, thanks for stopping by. Nice to meet you, too. Okay, bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Meredith, do you know what my mom would say? Do you know what she would say to me if she knew I was associated with black people? She'd say, oh, so you're associated with black people. <laughs> no, I doubt it very seriously. Well, that's what, a, what did your mom say? Did she know? Does she even know what they are? Of course she does. Her best friend is black. Well, no, there's, there's, there is a difference. What's the difference? I'm white. They're black. They're low. I'm high. I have the opportunity to do but, what I but, want. But really, but, listen, listen, listen. Mom wouldn't lie to me. I doubt it very seriously. Well, because she, she's a, she hates she hates blacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now you know I, I like both races. So Thank now you. that you know that, I guess you hate my guts. No, I don't hate you, Meredith. I mean, we're best friends. I couldn't hate you for that. For, you know, if you hate me. them, you hate me. <laughs> Simple as that. If you don't like the way I, you know, like... A lot of Americans believe that the storm is over, at least for successful blacks. But blacks are experts about the dailiness of their own lives, and they know the storm rages on. do more than survive without moving into a posture of hating individuals? How do we attack a system that has systemic evil and realize that that's not the individual, it's the system? Dr. King used to talk about we don't have to hate while we straighten the situation out. Um, but the battle goes on, and because you're a Christian, the quality of the battle has a different, has it, because you, you, you are challenged to be like God, where you hate the sinner, not the sinner. In a conversation with Christ, what the Word says about racism comes through loud and clear. Botha is wrong. South Africa is wrong. Apartheid is wrong. Oppression is wrong. Anybody who feels white skin is superior to black skin is wrong. The president of Japan is wrong. The president of Lebanon is wrong. The president of the Cook County Democrats is wrong. The president of the U.S., who doesn't even know his own black cabinet members, is wrong. Anybody who thinks white skin is the primary qualification for being mayor in this city is wrong. of person. God has created a one blood all the nations that dwell on the face of this earth. God don't like ugly and he ain't too particular about pretty. In a conversation with Christ, even the race issue gets clarified. And that's right here in this passage, too. You see, the culture, the culture had a race problem back in John 4. This ain't nothing new we going through. The Samaritans were the spooks. As far as the Jews were concerned. They were nothing. They were nobody. They were to be looked down upon. Like you got separate entrances and separate facilities. One for one race and one for the other. That's what's going on in verse 9. You can't even use the same utensils. Got Jim Crow and apartheid in John 4. The culture said a Jew was not even supposed to talk to a Samaritan simply because he or she was a Samaritan. Sort of like 
black and white in the city council of this Samaria. <laughs> but what the culture says and what the Christ says are two different things altogether. The culture says certain people can't talk to you because you were born in a certain race. The Christ says in verse 26, I'm talking to you. Don't care what the culture says. I am he who am talking with you. The culture says you're inferior. The Christ says you are an equal. The culture says you're the wrong race. The Christ says I made your race and I ain't made no mistakes. The culture says you are ugly. The Christ says you are beautiful. The culture says your skin is black. The Christ says, and so was mine. <laughs> the culture says, your hair is naked. The Christ says, it's just like mine. The culture says, you got to change and be like Miss Ann. The Christ says, I love you just the way you are. And I came to make a difference in your destiny, not in your ethnicity. However acute the needs of Trinity's members, they pale in comparison to the needs of people living in the vast stretches of impoverished neighborhoods strewn throughout Chicago's inner city. A third of all black Americans are poor. Those in cities like Chicago are more isolated than the urban poor of a generation ago. And they're having babies. Better than 40% of all black children in America are growing up poor. neighborhoods, there is the gritty survival of churches like this. the disquieting sense that as the population in need expands and grows younger, the churches which serve the poor in the areas of maximum pain are growing older and smaller. And that will mean a big difference in the lives of those growing up in the housing projects of the inner city. When you uh, look back on the better days when you were young here, mm -hmm. um, was the church a part of your lives? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was church. No church. Yeah. Yeah. Why'd you go to church? Well, our parents, you know, they got us up every morning. Hey, we're going out to church. And that's what we did. The nuns used to come out with this big laundry bag, and in the laundry bag were dolls and baseball bats and volleyballs. The kids now don't have that. You know. well, the These women are all single mothers who grew up in this project. They are now organized to provide younger women here, both with advice and with links to the outside world. If um, you had all of the black ministers in town sitting at a table and they said to you, what is it that the black churches of Chicago ought to be doing to improve the conditions of low-income people? What would you tell them? Marie, what would you tell them? If he would teach the mother, well, this is your mother. This is, these are the things that a mother is supposed to do. You know, you're, you're a father. This is the father role, and you're the children. These are the things the children are supposed to do. These are the things the mother is supposed to teach the child. You know, if church was like that, I think you would get more parents and fathers in church. You know, if the people want to come to you, 
then you go out to them. Do some outreach and knock on doors. Find out what it is. I'll ask them. I feel like they need their self-esteem built up. The people do. The people do, yeah. I, I think they need to get a grip on who they are and what they're capable of being and what they're capable of doing. I think the churches need to stress that more with their uh, people that's coming into the church. Yeah. To make them feel like they are somebody, not just anybody, somebody. The needs of those who are left in places like this are overwhelming. They need food and jobs and education for their children. And they need role models and people who will fight for them every day. But the two parts of black America are rapidly being propelled farther and farther apart. And those in the black middle class as well as the churches that attract them, must now struggle not only with their own problems, but their relationship with and obligations to other blacks. Because a few blacks have made it, they stop looking at the masses who are locked out. They really don't see them. They're invisible. Um, that's a frightening reality in terms of the large number, overwhelmingly large number of blacks who, who do not see I don't owe anybody, I mean, you know, I've got mine, you got yours to get. <laughs> very, uh, very self-centered, very selfish. I, I preach against them, I talk about, you know, that kind of focused religion that's, the Lord bless me and my wife, my brother John, and his wife, us four, no more, amen. <laughs> but no, I'm not giving anything back to anybody, you know. I made it, why can't they? Um... I think that if the average black person is determined enough that uh, they can overcome. Of course, there are obstacles that, that are gonna be in your way and you're gonna have to be more determined. One of the many groups at Trinity is the singles ministry. Mostly young black professionals on their way up. Some members of this group provide a test of the staying power of Wright's message. Do you believe the single mother who is 20 years old on ADC living in the Robert Taylor homes can make it and make it for her child just by applying extra effort? Well, now, I, I, I believe that this can be because of the fact that black women, women are, to me, in my opinion, are given a better shot at jobs, positions, more so than black men. I think that the black man is being emasculated to an extent. What's your view on that diet? I would probably agree that a mother, 20 years of age, could probably make it with determination. You've got to take up your bed and walk, so to speak. I mean, if you want to work, I mean, there's a job out there. It may not be the one you want. It may not pay the money you want, but there's something somewhere. And you can do it. I mean, if you, if you set it in your mind that you're going to do it, because at 40 years old, they're going to still be saying the same thing. With self-determination, belief in God, and in prayer, everything is possible. Are any of you in secular organizations that the primary purpose of which is to improve the condition of the black poor? I think that our mm -hmm. church is, is that. You know, I've been so busy at Trinity and the singles ministry. I, Trinity is and and Bible study and all the other right. things that are going on. And I have not, and I probably should reach out and do that. Yeah. I mean, and you know, Chicago has a lot of street people. Okay. But in the winter, while it's getting cold, that's when you truly notice them. And we all got frantic and we were trying to figure out how we could house these people and get cops and do whatever. And then we, you know, Saying, we're talking about a lot of money. Beyond anything that we could come right. you know, see mm -hmm. out there doing. They needed a warming center. They needed people to go pick up people who were in crisis. Yeah, there's so much to do. You know, so so many people are in need, and you can't, uh, you just can't help them. You all. don't know where to begin. And what you do is just do what you can and let it fall out. That's all you can do. Hope somebody else does. Right. Something. Somebody else will mm -hmm. latch on to it. But we like this thing called passing the buck. We need to stop Wanda Jefferson is a young member of Trinity who grew up poor 
and after prying open the door to a middle-class life, changed course to become a minister. We like to pass the book. We need to stop thinking that the pastor is supposed to solve all problems. And we need to stop finding out what the problems are and help support the pastor in solving the problems. But we like this thing called passing the book. When I was a child growing up, and we would do something bad, there were seven of us, my mother would start with my sister who was the oldest and say, what happened? And then she would go down the line. And we liked passing the book. We say, Mama, if we just hadn't have told me, I wouldn't have done it. And she never said a word. She would just get her best and start and go down the line and just move all of us. And when she finished, she'd say, I know I got the right one now. <laughs> there are some blacks for whom blackness is character building. Wanda Jefferson became a minister in part to use the pulpit to make people uncomfortable about not helping other blacks. There are a lot of people that are sitting up in churches on Sunday that are nodding, uh, but yet you're not seeing the effects of it in their lives. And I, you know, I really do believe that they, they may be in fear of, you know, if I start doing all of this stuff, you know, for all of these other people, what's going to happen to me? You know, am I still going to be able to get my pie? Not realizing that the pie is rotten anyway, you know? Um, so I think that there's this fear of, I may not get mine. There's a fear of going back, you know. Uh, sometimes when you're there and you're, you're in the old neighborhood, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes you stop and you say to yourself, how did I really make it? You know, how did we ever make it out of here? The physical and the human devastation created by American racism is far too broad and deep to be repaired by blacks alone. But if black individuals and black institutions do not initiate remedies, if they do not continue to define the problems, the rest of the nation will simply turn away. Some churches do try to reach back and touch the inner city. The Purchased Church of God sends its bus to the housing projects every week to pick up youngsters for the half-hour ride to Sunday school. Twenty years ago, any one of those girls might have been Vivian Diane Hudson, a child of the housing projects, who grew up to be a teacher with a master's degree, a wife, and a mother of two daughters. Every Sunday morning, she now drives an hour from her suburban home to Trinity. Purchase Church, Church is doing what the black church has always done. When everyone else in the society says you can't, the church says you can. The journey back to these places is much quicker than the journey out. But many black families have a child like Diane, who did make it out, into the mainstream of American life. Often the story of making it involves the church. When I was growing up, the church was like a, an extended part of my family. They were the ones who said that anything that you want to do and you desire to do, you can do it. You just have to put your mind to it. But Reverend Reed would always say, Diane, don't forget from which you've come, you know. And I can't forget because it is, it's embedded in me. The children who ride to purchase are among the fortunate. Because this church, poor as it is, tries harder than most black churches. Churches are involved in many things, but not in helping the poor. Many churches today, they are involved in raising money, but not for the right things altogether. 
they'll do a token, you know, of something just to make a show. Christ is not manifested enough in the lives of the people that are doing these, uh, this type of a church. Uh, it's more to form and fashion rather than uh, lifting up the name of Jesus. And this is the uh, whole purpose of the church from the beginning. But uh, the church has just kind of slipped away from their responsibility. Purchased fulfills its responsibility with help from its rich neighbor Trinity, which pays for its food pantry. Only a block apart, but serving different worlds, these two churches are activist places, and thus exceptional. Unfortunately, most churches now are status quo. And so that, you know, to the extent they're not trying to feed the poor, and they're, they're not trying to find, hook up jobs and people, they're not concerned about the lowest, the least, the left out. They're not concerned about the youth. They're not concerned about, they're concerned about, come, let me come here on a Sunday, hear something that tells me I'm okay and I'm going back to where I've been going, don't rock the boat. And when you look at the numbers, and look at the facilities they have, and look at the potential for what they could be doing, they're not doing it. We are not doing the church, we, no. Diane Hudson, though, is setting up a program to tutor young people in her old neighborhood. I, I feel guilty. What, what are these kids getting now? Who are, who are giving to them? We must pay back. It, it's not a such thing as you take and you don't give anything in return. And because we were given so much, we owe something to that community. We owe something to the people that live in that community. It's family. And so I cannot but stay connected. And I, there's a need, there's a drive inside of me to not to lose that. She has a personal memory and a racial memory. It is one of her roots back into herself. And I've been that memory was rekindled at Trinity. Its annual ritual for the black family is one of its attempts to revive a collective memory to provide each of its members with a root back and thus to build the community's strength. Malcolm X asked the question, if a cat has kittens in an oven, do you call those kittens biscuits? Sons and daughters of Africa, born in America, your histories you shall talk about to your children and teach them diligently. Talk about it when you wake up. Talk about it as you go through the day. Talk about it at the end of the day. For the school systems into which they go are oven systems. They are not taught that they are kittens, but that they are biscuits. It was a long time ago. I have almost forgotten my dream, but it was there then in front of me, bright as a sun, my dream. The bottom of the land The bottom of the land But I learned I live for and on For many rest Africa, Asia, and America like a one-eyed giant, bringing with him knowledge without understanding, science without wisdom, religion without ethics, and violence without vision. We remember that 
confused day in 1863 when those who brutalized our minds, bodies, and spirits for 400 years told us, y'all free now, here. Yeah? Our fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers, ask themselves the question, freedom, to do what and with what? For the blood of our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers, our great-grandparents, we drink together in remembrance. Our writers foretold the future in this fashion. God gave Noah a rainbow sign. No more water, but fire next time. You cannot defer a dream. Fire in what? You cannot defer a dream. Fire in Chicago. You cannot defer a dream. Fire in Detroit. You cannot defer a dream. Fire in Newark. You cannot defer a dream. Fire in New York. You cannot defer a dream. Fire in Boston. Fire, fire, fire. Once again, a bruised and battered and shaken people looked to Mother Africa for direction and found it in a return to blackness. Millions of our people are now able to look into our own mirror of cultural values and say with King Solomon, I am black and beautiful. Black family, don't stop dreaming. It's nation time. Black family, don't stop loving. It's nation time. Black family, don't stop sharing. It's nation time. Black family, don't stop praying. It's nation time. Black family, don't stop working. It's nation time. Black family, don't stop waiting on the Lord. It's nation time. In the end, because of their success, Trinity and its members must struggle with an obligation imposed by injustice in the larger society. This church will be measured by how much of its power will reach beyond its own doors and by how many of its members will reach back, back to those left behind. Last month, the third largest black church in America, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, hosted a gathering of national black leaders of several faiths. They addressed the increasing problems of the black poor and called for a new activism, using the economic power of black churches to press for change through boycotts and through investing their wealth in black communities. And black church power may be further recognized in the year to come an election year in which the black vote has the potential to make a difference in local, state, and national races. Thank you for joining me. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night. Coming up on Frontline, the biggest corruption scandal in New York City in 50 years. Everybody struggles for why did this happen and how could it have happened in New York City. An inside look at the prosecution of crooked officials and a bribery scheme involving hundreds of thousands of dollars. The practice of politics in this city stinks. Watch The Politics of Greed on Frontline.
For a transcript of this program, please send $4 to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Frontline was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Schools, colleges, and other organizations interested in purchasing or renting video cassettes of this program may call 800-424-7963 or write PBS Video, Post Office Box 8092, Washington, D.C., 20024.